All right, um, if you can be seated, we have a very vibrant session. It has to do with uh, India's future, how to build India uh, innovatively. And uh, we have a very um, uh, exciting guest for us. Um, he's the CEO of Rocket Space, a very innovative company right here in the Bay Area and uh, we can learn from his experience. If you can get seated, we'll start. Coffee is coming, it's not there yet. Refreshments are coming, uh, they're not there yet. But uh, just hang on just for a few more minutes and then we can uh, move forward with our agenda. You know, um, the last session is called Replicating Silicon Valley creating innovation ecosystems. Um, every country wants to be innovative and be competitive in the new knowledge economy. Every head of state visiting the Silicon Valley promises to build one back home. But money and policy cannot replicate Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley has evolved over time and has developed a unique culture of permissive creativity. India can learn from Silicon Valley's dynamic, dynamics and let its education and technology hubs develop their own unique innovation ecosystems. My next guest um, um, is the CEO and founder of a company called Rocket Space. I had him in my class three years ago and I just visited him a couple of weeks ago and I was amazed at the traction that his company has and some of the uh, thinking behind that very innovative model. I would just like to put a couple of slides on the screen here just to illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, I was in um, Colombia just a couple of uh, week, uh, months ago and I was telling them, don't fall into the same trap of horizontal innovation like China has. You know, what China does is show them a car, they can make zillions like it. It's horizontal innovation. You know, and it's mainly, there's no new learning taking place here. It's an economy that's built on um, repeating what was done before based on best practices. And best practices are a dead end that lead you no place. But what I, Silicon Valley is built on this thing called vertical innovation, and that is something that India needs to look forward to, as well as China, because horizontal innovation is good, but it's not really sustainable. It doesn't build a strong economy and give the competitive edge. So if you give Silicon Valley a car, they, you know, they, tend to not to produce zillions like it, they build a driverless car. Give them a typewriter, they will build a word processor. Give them a rotary phone, they will give you an iPhone, a smartphone. You know, the, the difference between those is there's new learning taking place here. This, it uh, captures the creative juices of the population and uh, young talent. And, you know, and it deals with uncertainty. You know, we have a hard time dealing with uncertainty and, uh, you know, and not going on the path that is untraveled. So there's no formula here. It ex it's an exercise in, um, uh, in thinking ahead. Uh, and technology always has to do more with doing less, with less. So this is the, so if India wants to move forward, uh, I think we need this kind of innovation, vertical innovation. You know, we don't want to be, yes, manufacturing is good, but we don't want to manufacture zillions like it. So the kind of companies that Doug deals with are the ones that are mature, but he also deals with companies that are very young. He has a great balance between the two. Most companies, when they become big, they tend to die. Why? Because no innovation is taking place. You know, they become what I call elephants. So you need another life 
for innovation to take place. You need a new innovation coming in, and the dead elephant has to die. So, uh, so new innovations are necessary, and that's the space in which Doug, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Duncan Logan uh, works in. So Duncan's company uh, works, deals with both. It deals with the elephants that cannot make a U-turn, and they're dying due to lack of innovation, and also young companies that are like leopards. They are agile, they, uh, they, they can take U-turns, they can run fast, they can change direction. And, uh, and so how do you solve this puzzle? Uh, uh, you know, Duncan Logan has a great formula and his company has been uh, growing exponentially. And the only way for a company to, a large company to move forward or even it could be a nation, it could be an organization, is to become and think more like a leopard. So which means the elephant or the dinosaur, the large companies have to become pregnant with leopards, give birth to more of these agile creatures. And that's what uh, uh, Duncan does, and he does it in a very creative way. And I felt, you know, this is a wonderful solution uh, for, um, uh, in, uh, India, how India to th move forward and think differently. And uh, you know, there are companies like this right in our backyard. In my backyard, there's a company in South San Francisco that keeps innovating itself because they come up with products that are just uh, so innovative. When one dies, they pick up another one. It's called Genentech. It's also true with Procter & Gamble, P&G. Uh, they keep innovating. And that is the kind of thinking that Silicon Valley produces. And we're finding more and more innovations are coming from younger companies, smaller companies, and not large companies. So that's a new trend. And India has the talent, India has ideas, and we need to capture this. And so as we kind of become uh, you know, a, a, a nation that where people don't have this long product life cycle since speed to market is increasing, it becomes very, very challenging for us. And that is a space in which uh, Duncan Logan uh, works in. And the last one here that I want to share, last slide here, it has to do with the fact that today's money is not made from tangible assets, but knowledge assets. See, when I was going to college, it was 80% or 83% were fixed assets. So you can touch them, feel them. But today, most of the assets from which revenue is derived is knowledge assets. They're molecules, formulas. And uh, now they, do, they evaporate very, very fast. They do, their life uh, span is very short. So today they might be worth 100 million. Tomorrow they might be worth zero. So that's the challenge we have. And with that, I would just like to have a little fireside chat with uh, Duncan Logan. Um. Duncan, uh, Hi. Uh, and please tell a little bit about your company uh, before I shoot the questions. But before we get into that, I'm still trying to work out what um, illness I have that is going to be the end of me. I've been, <laughs> it's been fascinating watching, uh, watching today's uh, presentations. I think they're amazing. One of the stats I saw is America spends 18% of its GDP on healthcare costs, and India is only spending 2%. But if you look at the result, everyone still dies in America. So maybe India is not, not so far behind. Um, Rocket Space, so the, the motivation for Rocket Space, we started five years ago, and uh, the motivation really came from a comment by Mark Andreessen, which was software's eating the world. And when he made that comment, it made me think that we are gonna see this enormous explosion in the number of technology companies that form. And having started a number of companies before, um, young companies are, are like young people. They, they are a product of their environment. You are so affected by the people around you and the mindset and the thinking around you. So when I, I came to Silicon Valley from, uh, from Scotland, um, I thought, what's gonna be the modern stock exchange of tech? What's gonna be that nucleus for all these companies and for the best companies? to uh, work from. Um, and so that was the, the kind of original thought of Rocket Space. We put it together and um, yeah, the results have been sort of staggering. So actually what you do, you know, you entertain all these young startups that have the first 
uh, round of financing in your company, and then many of these large companies come and hunt for ideas that they could be seeded inside and so and give birth to larger, I mean, a, a new innovation, a new core business that didn't exist before. Yeah, so the, the corporate piece came along later, but this, the startup piece was our focus when we, when we started. We've now had about 850 startups come through. 16 of those companies have become billion dollar, what we call unicorns, billion dollar companies, uh, which is incredible. Uh, these companies collectively have raised about $13 billion in funding over five years. So as one, as one little ecosystem within a larger ecosystem, it's, it's been a, uh, a phenomenal push. And I think what people fail to understand with the technology cycle that we're now going through is that in the past, these companies, these technology companies would produce technology which they would then sell to the large corporates who then took it to market. But the internet has given everyone access to the market. So now they produce the technology and say, well, we'll just build the company ourselves, and we'll just disrupt who is in the way. And, and Uber, who is one of our early sort of successes, is, a, is tantamount to that. In the past, Uber would have produced the technology and sold it to taxi companies around the world to adopt that technology. And instead, what they said was, no, we, we can go straight to market with this ourselves and build the company. That sort of disruption has started to bring corporations to us. And corporations come to us from really two, one of two sides, fear or greed. And if it's fear, they talk about disruption, and if it's greed, they talk about innovation. But it's actually the, exactly the same thing. So we, we get these companies coming to us, and the, the, the kind of starting point, or the starting point of the conversation tends to be, what's out there? What do we not know about? You know, what startups are you seeing who are disrupting or working on our industry? or a certain part of our industry that we don't know about. So we, we kind of provide a uh, corporate sonar, um, if you like, that we, we can ping out there and from the bottom up start to tell them this is what's happening and this is where we think it's going to affect your industry and this is where you should be paying attention or making investments or making acquisitions and so forth. Besides uh, Uber, what are the other unicorns uh, you have been instrumental in producing? So. Um, Domo, Supercell, Leap Motion, Kabam, Mog, um, uh, an augmented reality one out of Europe called Blipper. Uh, so there's been, yeah, a number uh, who either genuinely started, Uber was just six people when they were in rocket space. They're now, I think, 6,000 or something. Um, and, uh, or, or we were their first West Coast office with some of the European unicorns. So before we take some questions from the audience, let me ask you a couple of questions. How can India provide a suitable infrastructure to the innovators, the young people in India? So India's, India to me is just fascinating. It's just, you know, coming from the UK to America, the, one of the most exciting things was just the size of the economy in America. And coming from a small economy and a small population to this, what seems like an enormous population, it's just bewildering to me. And then we start looking at the size of India and the opportunity of India, and it, it kind of belittles America. So I think, I, you know, I think the, the only two uh, threats to Silicon Valley are China and India. I think that's it. Uh, and they will eventually dominate. But, and, and so India, India has to look far enough into the future to say we are going to be a dominant part we are going to dominate this industry, and so then how do we set it up now? How do we take that futurist thought? For me, I think the success of Silicon Valley is because of the ecosystem. So it's not, you can't just throw a seed in the ground and expect it to, to grow. You need to you know, add heat and water and all the rest of it to, to get that, and it's exactly the same with a startup. Um, it starts with local government, regional government, universities, university programs. The universities that are around Silicon Valley are incredibly important to be pumping out um, entrepreneurial, innovative thinking uh, students into the ecosystem. You need uh, angel capital. Uh, you need venture capital. You need uh, startups, obviously. You need this kind of melting pot to bring around the serendipity that happens when you put five, six, seven hundred people who are all trying to build uh, billion dollar companies into one space. So, 
you know, I think it's about looking at the entire ecosystem and giving it a geographical focus. Um, you know, the valley has kind of worked in because it's surrounded by water. Um, you know, it's really condensed, and I think that's really important. And we see that in other cities, like London, has always had a big tech scene, but it was scattered out over the whole of London. And about six years ago, the government started talking about this in a typical British way, the Silicon Roundabout. They could have chosen something far more inspiring. But anyway, they chose a roundabout. And, and it kind of drew the technology scene together. And as, as it got together, it got more momentum, more energy. And it's, it's kind of bloomed to arguably Europe's biggest tech center now. And I think India has that opportunity too. Yes, I know you work with universities. And how can India's top universities work with uh, companies uh, in seeding and commercializing innovations? What would be a good formula for India? So um, I think, I think the, the, the university corporate sort of relationship is highly evolved here in Silicon Valley. And um, Haas and, and Berkeley is a, a classic example of that. Um, one of the things which I think is advanced here, which isn't around the rest of the world that we visit, is the IP transfer and uh, the encouragement for students to, be, to do entrepreneurial activities while at university. There's no better place to become an entrepreneur than while you're at university and you don't have commitments and other constraints and, and so forth. Um, so I, I genuinely think, uh, you know, India, fortunately, is very entrepreneurial. As a, as a race, I spent yesterday with a load of Japanese people, and their biggest problem is persuading people to, to have a shot at being entrepreneurs. I don't think India has that problem. So I, I think, firstly, freeing up IP. Secondly, encouraging students to think entrepreneurial. This is the future of India. Small business is already becoming the jobs driver of every nation in the world. Large companies are beginning to shed people, and it's, it's easy to automate 700 or 1,000 jobs at a large company, and that's what's happening. It's, it's driving efficiencies. So for any modern society, you need a very healthy entrepreneur ecosystem to boost, produce jobs for the future. One uh, last question here before we take questions from the audience. Uh, how can the government provide uh, uh, the ideal or regulatory environment for disrupting and the existing business model structures, or the existing structure, actually, to, to move India forward? So, I think India can learn from America's problem. And, you know, large companies get to such a power and scale that they, they, they slow down the innovation and they speed up the regulation. And they try and use their influence on government to regulate themselves into a protected environment where um, they can survive and thrive. Um, that, that seems to be disappearing partly because really disruptive startups often start as a legal company. Uber was illegal. Airbnb is illegal if you, if you follow the, the law of the land, but they know they can get so much traction so quickly that they can be large enough and well-funded enough to have the fight with local or regional legislation uh, when they get there. So, Large corporations, you know, are seeing that their their influence to uh, is is weakening. But I think, from a government point of view, it's absolutely essential that the government understands that while large corporates are valuable today, they are not going to provide the job growth and and society uh, of the future. And and governments need to uh, invest in uh, their programs. One of the things I think India, I, I'm sure it does it already. There's a certain priming of the pump that needs to happen. You need the first wave, second wave, second generation of, of companies to come out with successful founders and entrepreneurs who then invest in the next wave, who then invest in the next wave. And I think it's really important that India looks at, at uh, sovereign funds uh, not to invest on their own, but to invest alongside uh, angel investors and venture capitalists to prime that pump to get the ecosystem going. Because once it's going, it will, it will sustain itself, as we see here. I know earlier you, you just said that uh, in the beginning you started with startups uh, creating a gym for people to kind of exercise and work out their innovation models. And then later, now your core business it comes from 
uh, large corporates and what drew these large corporations to come and participate in your model and what's driving that? So I think um, over 50% over of our revenue is now from large corporates and, and consulting uh, and from all sorts of different corporates from Lego, uh, gaming company to Airbus to banking to right across the spectrum. Um, and, and I think what the corporates are seeing is that Firstly, the cadence of change is getting faster and faster, and that's, that shouldn't be surprising. The, the pace of innovation will get faster and faster. We now use very powerful computers to design the next set of even more powerful computers to design, so that, that cadence will get faster. It will be harder for, for large companies to keep up. Um, where, companies, where large companies are agile and where that that is becoming a real skill set of a company. It's not just about producing your product or producing your service. It's about being able to see a new market and move quickly to address that market. And that agility uh, is really um, important. Um, the, 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 the sort of changing model that we're seeing a lot of corporations take is rather than trying to design everything in-house, is to look for that symbiotic relationship with startups, so have a conveyor belt of startups producing new innovative ideas, products, and services, which they can take to market. And I think that's the that's going to be a, a model of future companies. Not every company will uh, develop its own products and services in-house. It's kind of outsourced or crowd crowdsourced innovation for large corporates. We're good. Uh, let's take some questions sir, for Duncan. Um, uh, there's a mi microphone is needed right here, um, right there. That's, that'll be good. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Shout. No. <laughs> So today we are only here in, in the Bay Area. Um, in January we'll be opening in partnership with uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland in London. Um, and we will be rolling out, um, I would think there'll be a dozen rocket spaces around the world by the end of next year. Well, we, I, having sat here today, the reason I'm here today is because we're very interested in India as a, uh, as a location um, for our future. So. The kind of startups that you have, are they coming from uh, uh, technology companies? Are you getting any biotech, pharma, or uh, is this part of the industry that... Uh... So, yeah, we, we mostly focus on high tech, and even within high tech, um, not a huge amount around pharma or med tech. Um, even, even the hardware side of things is, they need different assistance. You know, in the hardware, there's kind of two goals. There's the zero to one, building the prototype, and then there's the one to many um, sort of uh, growth. What we're focused on is helping high-tech companies go through that growth phase. So unfortunately, we, we, we don't do a lot about it. Uh, but do you see a future there where maybe there could be another kind of a rocket space that fosters that particular industry because they need innovation there too uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a very creative way that you are doing? Yeah, I think I, I'm sure there's already similar places like rocket space working purely focused on the health tech, biotech, you know, those sort of areas. Um, we have had interest in, in that, but you know, I think we'd then have to be providing labs and other, you know, a different sort of infrastructure, physical infrastructure. Um, but I think the concept would work. Now, you have just one lab here, right? And uh, are you, where would your next lab be? So London, um, London is a, a deal we've already announced um, in partnership with uh, RBS. Um, and we have another four or five, which we haven't announced yet. Um, but. Is It'll India one of them? India's not, uh, India's not one that we've secured anything on. Um, uh, you know, China is one that we have pushed into. 
Um, but we, we see, in, it was interesting hearing the hub and spoke methodology, um, because we see a very similar methodology that we would have a number of rocket space hubs uh, around the world in key uh, technology ecosystems and then connect those together. Because increasingly, startups that break out that are successful have to go global very early. And we, we see this again with Uber. Um, Uber was too slow to get into China and are now, you know, they're spending a billion dollars a year as a startup trying to compete with Didi. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, as soon as you're successful, you're global when you're on the internet. I think there's a question coming from there. If someone can take the microphone there. Uh, you know, what happens, and, uh, you know, most of the smart people, like Bill Joy has said, who is one of our former alum of our school, that most of the smart people work for someone else and not you. The only way to capture the global brain now is to go to places like Rocket Space and, and to look for new knowledge to flow into your company because your company cannot produce it. Uh, I think you just need to capture that and I think you're almost like an innovation intermediary mm. where you bring in fresh knowledge into a company uh, there so the company can grow. Yes. Yeah, so you already mentioned that you are interested in uh, something to do in India also. So uh, if you are going, say, tomorrow to India to set up something, what you do here, what, what is there already available and what is missing uh, to develop that kind of ecosystem in India uh, so that uh, record, rocket space can be as successful as it is here in India also? So for, for a country such as India, we would definitely choose partners to go into there's you know while there's a common theme there's always a local knowledge that you you need um, but I, I think in well I think every country would be surprised at how many young people are working on technology startups just scattered and the, and the starting point to help those people be more successful is to start to start to coordinate the community that having lived here in Silicon Valley we're so used to you know having venture capitalists on tap, having angel investors on tap, having mentors on tap. Um, if, you're, if you're working on your startup in, in your bedroom um, and, and that community hasn't existed, um, then we can play a big part in starting to coordinate that and putting the ecosystem together and then connecting the various components. Because one of the things we've seen is a lot of, you know, in Silicon Valley is, is this kind of really great thing. but as soon as people become rich, they say, this is great, now I can start investing in startups. Now, in London, as soon as they become rich, they say, this is great, I can buy a house in Spain, or I can buy a Ferrari, or, because there is no real ease or marketplace for them to go in and start investing in startups. And I think this is one of the opportunities we can do there is by coordinating, putting together, uh, you know, communities of, of investors and saying we can share the risk, we can spread the risk, we can educate you in how to get into angel investment um, and these are, the, you know, these are the returns and so forth, I think we can start to build that community uh, within you know, any major city uh, in India. Well, there's a question there. Thank you. Duncan, how do you attract new startups to rocket space? In other words, how do you differentiate yourself from all the other companies like yourself? Yeah. So fortunately, um, you know, it's, we're, it's a very connected community. <clears throat> so we're incredibly focused just on technology companies who have raised at least one round of funding. And for, you know, a, a large percentage of that population, even around the world, will, will know of rocket space. So we get 20 to 30 applications every week from companies all around the world. Um, wanting to come to rocket space or wanting to open an office in rocket space. So at the moment, it's, it's not being a challenge. Um, but I think this is, this is another thing about the internet, which I, I kind of advise on a lot of founders. You can build a very, very big company now focused on a very, very small problem. Because there's, you know, there's billions of people connected to the internet. And I think someone mentioned, was it earache? You know, there's 80 million people with earache. And, you know, that's a huge population. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the benefits of the innovation. So we're just focused on technology companies between stage seed and stage C. That's it. 
Um, so to, to differentiate ourselves, I think we've, we've proven that we really do focus on the quality uh, and it's not just about taking anyone in. So there's, there's lots of people who do co-working, which is just the real estate component. There's lots of people who do incubation, uh, which is great, you know, like Y Combinator or something. We don't touch that. We're kind of later stage. Um, and for the people who would put themselves in our, our space, I think we just, we've just put more resource at it. And, you know, working with the corporates, we now have a, a bigger corporate program than, you know, I think anyone else in, the, in this space. And, and that does have network effects. Um, we have a bigger team. They can do more in depth. We can afford to pay better quality people. The, the whole thing starts to separate. You, you start to build a moat around your business. Very good. Any other questions? Uh, all right. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Could you give us some examples of engagements you would have with large corporates? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think a lot of large corporates, um, uh, I think, Large corporates traditionally have gone to the big five, you know, an Arthur Anson, a PwC, or whatever, and said, you know, what's happening with our market, and where's the future, and, and Gartner will produce magic quadrants and say, this is where the market's going, and so forth. And, and I think there's now so many case studies of where, from the top-down view, you get that wrong. I was speaking earlier about AT&T, three times through the 80s, we're told, don't go into mobile phones. It's never going to be a market more than just a niche end. Uh, and that was from you know one of the big five. The, they're they're coming to us for that ground up because we we see the world from the bottom up, from the grass from the grassroots. And often, um, you know, so even three four years ago, companies were coming to us and saying, you know, Bitcoin or the blockchain, and we're going absolutely the blockchain is going to happen because we can see the volume of investment going into the blockchain. We can see the amount of interactions on GitHub, we can see the number of startups, we see it's, it's going to happen. And then the corporates say, well, how is that going to affect us? And you might be a real estate company, and we say, well, you know, um, the, the whole industry of providing escrow is going to disappear, so you better get out of that industry. Or you might be an audit company and saying, well, as soon as accounting puts accounts straight into the blockchain, audit's going to disappear. So you better get out of that industry. Or you might be a financial organization who's trading and you have you know, hundreds of people and you're charging your clients for doing trade settlements. Well, the Australian Stock Exchange is now doing instantaneous settlements using the blockchain. So all those settlement jobs and that settlement revenue is going to go. So, get out. so we're, we're kind of sometimes shocking, but we're introducing stuff early on that if they're thinking, oh, we should take you know, we should grow our settlements business, we're going, absolutely not. Or we should grow our audit practice, we're going, that would be the worst thing you want to do. So uh, some of it is advisory, but often they challenge us to say, well, show us companies that are really doing that. Bring, you know, bring them to us. So we do these physical demo days, often with the C-suite of the corporate, uh, and then, you know, four or five startups who are fine-tuned and, and brought in, uh, who are there for that. Um, executive briefing session. So part of it is education. And then what's happening now is a lot of those corporates are investing. You know, I think any modern corporate is going to see more and more dollars put into open innovation sort of uh, activities just to, to stay relevant and keep up with uh, the changes going on. I'm curious uh, as to why you chose China before India. You know, I think uh, China is horizontal innovation, right, as I showed you, and I think Indians are vertical innovation, so, you know, that's, they're creating the Silicon Valley right here. I think, I think the answer to that is China shows us. <laughs> but, um, no, I, both, both are fascinating economies. Um, I, think, I think Americans struggle to under... Uh, America wants to give a hundred reasons why China's not working, why they're building empty cities, why their economy can't keep up that rate of growth, and, and, and they just, they, they're just not used to having another enormous economy coming onto them. And it's, it's inevitable. China's economy is going, and India's economy are going to way outpass America. Um, that's, that's inevitability. And, and I think 
you know, for me as a, as a foreigner in America, I can see that. Um, but Americans find that slightly harder to chew. Well, very good. And I think if there are other questions, we'll just, I just want to thank you for coming by and uh, enlightening us. Uh, it's a great business model. Just fascinated. Uh, and I hope that you'll get to India before China, though. <laughs> right.